Hello and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Triolinguo. You've heard of Duolingo, but have you heard of Triolinguo? It's like Duolingo, but better, because it's based on science, and in particular, it's based on neuroscience. We present information only to your language lateralized hemisphere. We speak directly to your Heschel's gyrus, and we show words directly to your visual word form area. And above all, we help you learn two languages at once. Uh, So fly past bilingualism and go from monolingual to trilingual with triolinguo. Can you find anything better? Puedes encontrar algo mejor? And now I'm going to try Esperanto uh, because I'm using triolinguo and it's helping me learn not only Spanish but also Esperanto. So, Kivo, Povas, Triovi, Ian, Pli, Boban. You know that uh, if you speak Esperanto, that I said, can you find anything better? Uh, and obviously, from my amazing pronunciation of both Spanish and Esperanto, uh, without tripping over either of them, uh, there's evidence that Triolingo is working. So, mention keyword engage brain and receive 10% off your first month fee. Research in neuroscience finds ways being bilingual can be an advantage. Since this is the second time I'm talking about bilingualism, I'm going to use the same introduction. So somewhere around 20% of the U.S. population is bilingual, and that number is steadily increasing. Besides being able to speak more than one language, years of research has indicated that bilingualism has a number of other advantages, from understanding and appreciating cultural references to opening up new job opportunities, and even being able to express yourself in different ways, in different forms or different personalities. Uh, Language and thought are so closely intertwined, it raises the question of how brains of monolingual speakers and bilingual speakers are different. So today I speak with Daniel Bordy about the advantages of bilingualism. Good. So uh, I'm here with Daniel Bordy, and we're talking about bilingualism or bilingual brains. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'd like to start with the same question I start uh, by asking everyone: uh, What got you interested in, in uh, this topic? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it mostly comes from like personal experience, mm-hmm. I guess, being uh, myself bilingual and like having grown up in a house that like uh, English and Italian was always been spoken um, in Rome, actually. And um, so I was just like interested in what kind of effects uh, this could or would have like on brains or on like uh, cognitive development or another big effect that was found is in uh, uh, like protection, like cognitive um, in in old age. So um, yeah, cognitive reserve. Exactly, cognitive reserve. So um, I was just curious about going more into the topic. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, that's, there was also a lot of like good amount of research on it, so it seemed like a good idea. Yeah, and are both your parents bilingual, or was one parent uh, English speaking and the other parent well, Italian? So they're both basically bilingual actually, because my mom is American originally, hmm. and my dad is Italian. But my dad studied in the states. Um, actually, he did a PhD in uh, in neuroscience. Oh, okay. Actually, in uh, NYU, so uh, he he learned English that way and then they both moved back to to Italy so they both really speak both uh-huh. so in fact in my in my house it'd be pretty common to just like use some words of Italian some of English yeah know, the same phrase um, so yeah yeah uh, Chantella who was also uh, interested in bilingualism for her project was saying that uh, it, sometimes you just don't even know that you're switching back and forth yeah yeah, yeah. it's almost like seamless um, and yeah it's true and the um, so, yeah. yeah, and can I ask uh, off topic what uh, area of research your uh, father uh, pursues in well, neuroscience? He did a lot of uh, fear. Oh, process. okay. He actually worked with you know uh, with um, Ledoux. Oh, okay. He 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 like wrote a, co-wrote some papers at yeah. the time. So it's actually pretty interesting in class. I've seen the name. Yeah. yeah. It's it's pretty cool. Oh yeah, that's fun. And Liz Phelps was a uh, I don't know if he would have overlapped with her. Uh, that uh, some of the work that we were talking about yesterday was uh, with her and Joe Ledoux. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Yeah. 
So that, that was interesting. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, but yeah, now he does uh, mostly, he works for a pharmaceutical company. Because like in Italy, <laughs> there's a research, there's not very much. Yeah. So, but, you know. Uh, and in terms of your research on, uh, you mentioned kind of things like um, linguistic development, cognitive reserve, uh, what have been some of the most interesting findings for uh, bilingual brains? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, uh, see, mostly like a lot of the, the, the research I've found goes over uh, executive uh, function. So like uh, um, it, it, one of the models that were, was t is talked about a lot is the joint activation one in which like it seems like both the, the parts of the brain involved in one language and the ones involved in the other are always like somewhat um, active at the mm -hmm. same time even if you're doing some tasks that would not seem to be related to like English while well, you know or like the other language and so that seems to like have some kind of effect in uh, except your executive control in which like your brain seems to like since it has to concentrate so much in terms of like inhibition and control um, help that so that's an interesting finding I thought and uh, another especially interesting one was with the cognitive reserve and mm -hmm. how like um, uh, Biel Bielistock I'm not sure yeah, how, yep. how to pronounce that uh, found that like uh, like looking through the medical uh, data in a hospital I think it, in England somewhere um, found that like an average um, patients with that who were diagnosed with dementia um, were diagnosed with it three or four years later when they were bilingual compared to like the, the monolingual uh, counterparts and and it was also replicated the study with uh, Alzheimer's mm -hmm. so that, that was like pretty pretty interesting finding and like it's it would be in interesting to know more about it and see if like uh, you know, in terms of health benefits, like, is it really very useful to, to learn a language or not? Um, so that was some interesting finding for sure. Um, and um, what else? An another interesting thing that I found actually was that uh, looking through um, De Bruyne's work and how she, she basically looked at all the symposium um, discussions about, like, articles that would be were in the course of being published um, throughout, I don't remember exact, the exact period, I think it was at least 20, 30 years at least. Mm -hmm. um, and she found that basically while like 60% of the research that uh, seemed to in imply that there was some kind of positive effect from bilingualism was published, while like on the, that counterpart, like only 30% of the, the research that seemed to show no effect or even negative effect so that that's also like I found quite interesting because like, yeah it seems like like it's also understandable because you want to probably like publishing houses and you know they want to show um, like some kind of effect something but yeah like it still gives some kind of a biased uh, reading on, on the matter yeah that, that, bit, that's so. interesting to see how, how well, like, twice as much um, positive effects versus negative effects yeah, negative or, or just no effects. No effect. yeah, exactly. Yeah. But so that, it, at the same time, it seems like, what what can it hurt? <laughs> no effect. I yeah. mean, it can hurt maybe, like, one main thing was in the verbal fluency of each language, you probably have less of it, you know, compared to a monolingual. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely something that's been found, like, in various studies that uh, is impacted a little bit. Is it... Um, like, is it worth that, you know, like, that kind of thing? Probably, but, you know, who knows? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it seems like the positives that you get yeah. far outweighed. There's also just the positive in itself of knowing another language, you know, like, in terms of communication and traveling and jobs, like, it, it's something that is useful, so, in itself. Yeah, in, in the introduction, I note that it just kind of, like, open, unlocks these opportunities that uh, monolingual uh, person yeah, is, no. like, ignorant exactly. to. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, even for me, like, if my mom hadn't, like, hadn't spoken to me, you know, in English since, uh, since I was young, I would not be here at all. Yeah, because, right. Because I went through, like, Italian public school process, and 
Like, there's no way I would have learned English through, like, the, an adequate level. Yeah, there's no like, requirement for uh, second language? In... There is, there is. It's just not taught very well. Oh, okay. Go, having gone through the, the process, I know. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. So, not, yeah. So that's, that's something also to consider. Yeah, and so kind of switching gears a little bit, uh, you uh, produced a, a BuzzFeed article about um, bilingual. Mm-hmm, I did, uh, I did. And uh, what is, have you heard anything back from fr- family or friends? Uh, mostly mostly some other people in uh, other psychology classes. Oh, okay. Because I think you, you shared it with um, um, your other your seminar. Uh-huh. So I, I know a, pe- a couple couple of people in that class who, who've who read it and, and so forth. And some other people in another class as well. So mostly okay. fellow psychology students. Okay. Um, but yeah, so some kind of feedback. Not not a ton, but uh, yeah, it's always interesting. Yeah. To see what they have to say. And do you think that uh, there's anything that's kind of confusing about uh, bilingual brains? Uh? I mean, as I said, po- like a lot, a lot of these met mo- like for example, the joint activation model is you know it's a hypothetical model, mm-hmm. so it's still like kind of uh, there's nothing definite about like these effects yet, even the effects of cognitive uh, of um, executive control, like it's kind of a generic definition of, mm-hmm. in itself, um, but like yeah, uh, so maybe these things could be uh, they're not like very specific definitions of things and so it's not yeah okay uh, <laughs> and do you think uh, there's any research that suggests that some people's brains are just uh, a little bit better at kind of taking up a second language well this I, I haven't looked into this part of it so mm-hmm. much uh, I assume there are but one one other of the things that like the articles went over that I was, I was looking at was how, like, uh, maybe, like, for example, in the brains that, like, the people that seem to have higher scores in executive control, mm-hmm. because, you know, and correlated with the bilingualism, they were saying that maybe, like, there's a causality there because someone who's more adept to learning a language will also have, like, higher, you know, executive control. Yeah. Uh, but, like, they seem to also, like, contradict this by saying that. Um, in reality, like a lot of people who are bilingual are not really like it's not a thing that they choose. It's more like you know, here you are, you are, or you're not like you're, you know, it's some, it's a situation that you kind of need to be, or um, so that's also like the drawback. It's like um, it seem, it seems to be like, yeah, some people probably are more adept to it, but. If you put in a position of doing it, like uh, you know, most people generally are. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it sounds kind of like a chicken and egg phenomenon. So, uh, are you bilingual because you have better cognitive control exactly. at these other things, or uh, you are bilingual so then you have these other executive yeah, functions? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. It's hard to hard to distinguish. Yeah, and I, I was. Uh, um, Kind of thinking about the question because there's a guy that works for the UN that's like fluent in I don't even want to say like mm-hmm. more than a dozen languages. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's that's the other thing. So if like it, with multilingualism, then that comes into play a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like that, um, like someone who knows maybe two languages because like his parents are both speaking a different language. That's mm-hmm. that's a separate case. But like it, it's but if you if you know more, then then it means that probably you have like exactly more abilities and like you're just naturally more gifted so that would be that would be go more towards the, the idea of like yeah you have better um, executive control so you, you're also better at languages right. in general so, yeah. yeah and there's another guy I'm gonna get his name wrong I wanna say like Daniel Tennant or something uh, he's a had like kind of a high functioning autistic individual mm-hmm. Uh, who was able to learn Icelandic like within a week um, I, and Icelandic is kind of considered one of the most yeah. difficult languages yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was because of his like super memory abilities yeah. uh, outside of language no in fact so there's definitely that that goes into it yeah for sure alright well I think I'm kind of running out of questions here so uh, I think we'll look to wrap up uh, we a little bit I talked a little bit before we started about uh, <laughs> 
things that you'd like to talk about or promote or think other people should check out? Uh, and so do you want to mention First Friday? Yeah, yeah. So no, I was just saying that um, I think a week or a couple of weeks ago, the, the school actually organized some buses for um, taking people to First Friday, which is like an event in Philly in which there are uh, basically like galleries open, have like little shows and you can walk around and go inside it. And uh, I mean, that goes just into the fact that I think it's it's good to get out of uh, Hereford campus sometimes as well. Yeah. Because it, like, it is it is a little small. It's also good to get out in the real world. <laughs> yeah. And uh, even though, like, we do have, like, a lot of work and a lot of things to do here, it's still, like, it's a good break. Yeah. And I, a lot of people don't do it, so I just encourage um, some exploring as well. Yeah, and it's kind of along the same lines as learning multiple languages, appreciating things outside of the yeah, yeah. the bubble of Haverford. Exactly, exactly. Some different cultures and <laughs> some yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. yeah, so kinda of get out there and, and try things out. Not just in Philadelphia, but states, world, yeah, exactly. wherever you want to go. Alright, well thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. So thanks so much to Daniel for coming in and talking about bilingualism. I really enjoyed uh, hearing more about uh, second language. Uh, I think I might have mentioned in the other podcast uh, on bilingualism with Chantal Tavares about uh, my experience uh, trying to learn a second language. Uh, started in, I guess, fifth grade maybe? Uh, we were um, went through like a small course on uh, Japanese, uh, which was interesting. And then in sixth grade, uh, we started being able to take our... Uh, kind of choice of different courses. I think maybe one quarter at a time. Uh, you'd go through Japanese again, maybe uh, German, French, and Spanish. And then in seventh grade, you got to choose your own uh, course uh, and stick with it for the the rest of your time. So I chose Spanish. And starting in seventh grade, uh, all the way through high school, I took at least one quarter or semester of Spanish every year. I uh, had to take a year off because of poor <laughs> registration standing in college, uh, but then took an entire uh, year of uh, college Spanish in my sophomore year. And so now, almost 10 years later, I barely remember anything. Uh, at least I can't speak it. Uh, but uh, I think uh, I can read most uh, Spanish if you put a newspaper or something in front of me uh, or a, uh, a menu. But definitely, <laughs> I've kind of lost my uh, ability to, to speak uh, the language. So it's so interesting to... Uh, be able to speak with someone who does know more than one language. Uh, so wrapping up the podcast, uh, turning to Jake's Jams, something that I've been interested in lately. Uh, I always like to look at science. It's kind of our the pinnacle of uh, journalism and, and p- pinnacle of research uh, in uh, scientific fields. Uh, so sometimes there's some really interesting kind of editorial or more, uh, I, I guess, non- research-based uh, articles in science, uh, and there was a really interesting one from the Working Life section uh, by Patricia Perez uh, Corneo, uh, Researcher Discovers Teaching. Uh, it's something that uh, I think I discovered early. Uh, she's a uh, kind of large lab PI uh, who's been working for a number of years, uh, and uh, I know that I discovered uh, my passion for teaching teaching very early and uh, went to graduate school with uh, the uh, thought in mind that I would want to pursue teaching uh, all the way since I began uh, TA in uh, intro bio uh, and then later research methods and uh, finally uh, being a uh, pro- preceptor in the intro to psychology lab uh, my senior year of, of college where I was a likely terrible uh, presenter and a terrible uh, teacher uh, but it was my first uh, kind of real experience up in front of the classroom for uh, the entire semester. Uh, so it was a, a great opportunity and something that kind of set me off on the course that uh, I still am on today. Uh, so uh, in this latest uh, version of Science, uh, let's see, Science published April 8th, 2016, a researcher discovers teaching. Uh, it's really interesting to see uh, a researcher find uh, that teaching is valuable and fun and uh, interesting, uh, especially when many times... Uh, you don't see the large uh, researchers uh, treating 
teaching with the same kind of respect or enthusiasm. Oftentimes, researchers are trying to buy their way out of teaching and don't want to spend too much time teaching because it takes away from their research. Uh, and while I can appreciate that, I think that uh, teaching is a lot of fun and uh, oftentimes can be as fun and rewarding as uh, kind of the high points of research. Uh, so uh, check out uh, science uh, from the AAAS. And uh, turning to the last uh, portion of the podcast, the last segment, Twitter tweets or reader mail. Uh, nothing so far, but you can reach me at EngageBrain on Twitter or at EngageBrainPodcast at gmail.com with any questions or suggestions, and we'll uh, read them here. So this is bring the Engage Brain Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.